Without further ado, I'd like to introduce my colleague, uh, Dr. Lee Aminian. Lee, take it away. <laughs> Thanks, Phil, uh, for the introduction and the invitation. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm going to briefly talk about extended VTE prophylaxis after hospital stay, and I'm going to focus on bariatric surgery patients, which are high risk for the VTE. As we know, post of VTE is a major cause of morbidity and mortality. It can be preventable in many patients. And most VTEs occur after hospital stay. And few patients receive extended post-discharge prophylaxis. American College of Chest Physicians and the ASMBS have recommended that in addition to the mechanical prophylaxis, some form of pharmacoprophylaxis be administered to all bariatric surgery patients when they're in hospital. But what about uh, after hospital stay, when the patients are going home? So Phil, I think at this point, uh, we can hear from our colleagues uh, about this question, who should get extended thermal prophylaxis after bariatric surgery? I'd like to hear the colleagues' experience in their practice. Actually, that's a great question. So let's go to the various sites. Um, and this is a question not specific to bariatric, but to really uh, any abdominal um, or laparoscopic surgery. Um, and I'm going to ask each center, to what extent do they use extended prophylaxis, that is beyond the hospital stay, and for how long do they continue prophylaxis? I'd like to go first to our colleagues in Florida. And I see the handsome Steve Wexner right there. Um, Steve, um, within colorectal <laughs> surgery, do you guys send uh, home your patients on DBT prophylaxis at least for a certain subset of patients? No, only, I mean, if, if we had somebody who had a history in the past, we would, somebody on exceptionally high risk, but in the general scenario, no, we do not. Uh, I okay. can't answer for bariatric, I can't answer for the bariatric uh, segment of the population, but for colorectal, oh, yeah. we do not. We use the in-hospital prophylaxis, but they go home without. Well, listen to what Ali's going to say, because I think he's going to make a strong argument that for some of your patients, you might want to consider extended prophylaxis at home. Let's go to uh, our friends north of the border in uh, Nova Scotia, Dalhousie University. Good morning. Do you guys use extended prophylaxis in some patients? In the uh, bariatric population, we haven't been. Um, and then as far as uh, Again, it's the same sort of thing as, as routine within the colorectal population. We are not, uh, with the exception of uh, people who are, uh, you know, extremely high risk, i.e., previous uh, DVTs or known DVTs. So the, uh, uh, and of course you're treating. So, but we have we haven't adopted extended prophylaxis uh, as a routine practice here. Though it's something that's right. debated on a regular basis, it just hasn't been adopted, through, even through okay. you know, the various hospital committees. Okay, great. We're going to hear more from our other centers here. Let's go just down the list here. Duke University. Do you guys, uh, who's there at Duke? Is Dana there? Hey, Dana. Yeah, hey, yeah. how are you? Uh, it's interesting. We just had this discussion at a partners meeting uh, last night, uh, or maybe the night before, and so uh, we're, we've been using it limited uh, in kind of immobility and higher risk individuals, and we'll send them out on Lovenox for three weeks, but uh, we were looking at some of the scoring systems and thinking about adopting those and at least my take on them thus far is it looks like if we adopt some of these scoring systems most of our patients will go home on extended so we were talking about maybe adjusting the ranges but it'll be interesting for me to see what the discussion leads to today. Uh, Geisinger, let's go to Geisinger. We do, uh, we do extended prophylaxis on everybody. Uh, we do a risk-based uh, risk -based approach. Um, pretty much everyone with bariatric uh, surgery will qualify with three risk factors. Go home with a weight-based uh, prophylactic dose Lovenox for 10 days, and if they have more than three risk factors, it's up to 28 days. Okay, very good. So, so far, Geisinger is sort of the most, um, I guess, engaged with the extended prophylaxis concept. Thank you. Let's go to London, Imperial College of London. Our colleagues uh, across the pond. Good morning, Alex. Good morning. Here, uh, colorectal consultant. All of our colorectal cancer reception patients get 28-day extended DVT prophylaxis. 
Okay, so for colorectal cancer. Yes. Okay. All yeah. right. Bariatric, bariatric patients, no. Um, and our benign colorectal resections, uh, they also do not get extended DVT prophylaxis. They just get standard. Okay, very good. Maybe uh, Steve Wexner, who does not do that, might comment a little bit later. Good morning, Johns Hopkins. Good morning. Not very good. I can't quite see who that is. Is that? Yeah, Mike, Mike Murrow. We're, oh, we're here. Good right. morning. Mike. And, and our, our attendees are not asleep. Um, so, <laughs> very, <laughs> bariatrics, yes, for a month with low and ox weight based. Colorectal, um, using the Cabrini score, so do, using the different scores, whether it's Wells, Cabrini, Medindi, there's several out there. Um, surge Onc selectively, um, but we've got several initiatives trying to go down and identify higher risk patients and doing it for extended um, post-hospital stay. Okay, very good. So Hopkins is uh, definitely engaged in this concept. Um, let's go to Pennsylvania, Lackanau Hospital. Good morning. Good morning. Up or down with extended prophylaxis? Good morning. We don't do any uh, bariatrics here, but for our uh, colorectal cancer patients, we've been using it selectively. Uh, our GYN oncologists use it routinely uh, for all their cancer patients, and I definitely want to hear more data about, uh, about our you know, more effective use. Okay, great. So more of a selective approach there. Uh, this is Dan Heron. Hey, Dan. Uh, good morning. Uh, we were just discussing it ourselves. So we, um, we've gone kind of back and forth with more and less aggressive. We were initially, uh, about two years ago, we started following the Michigan uh, data and, and following their protocols. And going to more aggressive anticoagulation, we ended up with a lot more bleeding complications. And so that led to a little bit of a backlash. So uh, while we're in-house now, we just go with uh, standard unfractionated heparin. And then for after discharge, for our high-risk patients, which we define as, uh, you know, we don't use an official scoring. We, we it, it's still somewhat subjective here, but male gender, history of DVT, BMI over 50 to 60, depending on the attending, uh, we will treat with uh, four weeks of DVT prophylaxis at home. Okay, very good. I think Dr. Ali will be talking about that uh, something similar in just a moment. Um, let's go to uh, Mount Sinai, Beth Israel. Good morning. You got a nice crew there. Hey. Fantastic. What good morning. Good so morning. For, uh, for colorectal, we don't use, routinely use post-operative uh, and at-home uh, DVT prophylaxis. And I guess uh, Burke can comment on the uh, bariatric. For the bariatric, we sort of uh, follow what Dan does up at uh, Mount Sinai, very selective. Okay. Very good. I think you'll hear more about you know, this emerging concept. Uh, thank you very much for your input. And uh, just a couple left. Ohio State. Is Brad Needleman there, Ohio State? Hey, there he is. Good morning, Brad. I'm here. Yeah, we, we do you know, heparin pre-op. We do Lovenox uh, post-operatively based on BMI. We do check anti-10A um, antibodies, and we do, uh, we'll send them home typically on Lovenox um, for at least two weeks, and then reevaluate them in two weeks in the office. Okay, so you you send routinely everyone home on two weeks. No, no, no. Months. Just uh, just uh, previous DVTs, high risk, non ambulatory, previous pulmonary disease. Okay, because that's and some, they check anti. And they check anti ten A. So let's talk about that in just a minute. And then finally, uh, Winthrop Hospital, Winthrop University Hospital. What do you guys do? Good morning. Good morning. I'm Alex Axford. I'm the chief of trauma actually at Winthrop, and I can tell you from our perspective. Uh, all our patients, for the most part, are treated in hospital. If they're not fully weight-bearing, uh, either rehab, they go to on Lovenox, or even if they're going home, they're going to be put on Lovenox as well until we see them that they're fully weight-bearing. Do you want to comment about that? Yeah, so for the bariatric patients, we do uh, Lovenox therapy for two weeks postoperatively, only in those with BMI greater than 50. Okay. And also, we are actually monitoring the uh, study of thromboelastography on the bariatric patient, both in hospital as well as uh, outpatient as well. Okay. Okay, very good. Thank you. So uh, our audience has heard from quite a wide, wide variety of centers throughout uh, the world, and I'll leave pretty much a mixture. Sounds like 50% you know, don't do it, 50% do. So tell us what we should be doing. Yeah, that was a very interesting discussion. Uh, so we addressed this question, and the uh, 
uh, and this study was recently published in annals, who should get extended thromboprophylaxis after bariatric surgery. So we used the American College of Surgeon and Scoop data set, and we included all primary and revisional bariatric surgery cases from 2007 2012. We included more than 9,000 cases, and we used the 2013 database to check the validity of the risk model. Primary outcome was the occurrence of post-discharge uh, post VTE, including DVT and P within 30 days of the index bariatric surgery. Here is the characteristics of the patient. 79% were female with uh, mean BMI of 45. Uh, out of 323 cases of VTE, 269 occurred after hospital discharge. So that's, I think that's an important graph. It showed the post-op occurrence of DVT and PE. And as you see here, so uh, if we consider the length of a stay one or two days, you see most uh, post-op DVT and PEs occur after hospital discharge. And it's, it's very important in the era of enhanced recovery because we see uh, there is a trend to implement the enhanced recovery protocols in different surgical disciplines, and we're going to keep the patient just for one day in hospital, and if we give them just two or three doses of uh, uh, anticoagulation prophylactic doses, then we cannot prevent DVTs, which can occur 15 days, 20 days, 30 days post-op. So, uh, that's going to be a challenge, so we need to uh, do something to decrease the risk of the DVT and PE when the patients are going home. So interestingly, in this study, 83% 80, of post-bariatric surgery VTEs are care after hospital discharge, 83%. And in those experiencing a post-discharge VTE, mortality increased about 28-fold, which was very significant. So uh, we did multivariate analysis and we found, we identified 10 independent risk factors, including congest for uh, development of post-discharge VTE, including congestive heart failure, paraplegia, retained to operating room, dyspnea at rest, non-gastric band surgery, uh, older age, male, BMI over 50, length of stay, three days or longer, and operative time uh, longer than three hours. So the most uh, prominent risk factor was presence of CHA with adjusted odds ratio of 6.5, proplasia uh, uh, odds ratio of almost six, return to OR odds ratio of five, and we see the BMI was just one of the risk factors out of 10, and there are more important risk factors just the BM, compared just to the BMI alone. So we put together all these uh, risk factors and made a model, and the statistical analysis showed that the model has a good calibration discrimination and was valid. And we compared this model performance with BMI alone, because as we hear, some centers use the BMI alone as a, as a criterion for the for providing patients the uh, uh, prophylactic dose. And the model showed better performance compared to the BMI alone. Uh, as I showed you, the BMI was just one of those 10 risk factors. So the model is available online. If you Google Cleveland Clinic Calculator, you can uh, see this link, uh, Upper Vita. So the model is on this website now. That's the uh, upper beta website, and there are different type of different type of the models and risk assessment tools. And under obesity tab, you're going to see uh, this uh, risk calculator, risk of post-discharge VT after bariatrics. If you click on the use calculator, it, it needs a simple registration, free uh, registration, and then you can get access to that. So here is the model. If you put those ten. Uh, Yes and yes or no questions. Patients in, uh, enter patients' uh, data on that. Then it's going to give you the predicted probability of 30-day post-discharge VTE. Let me give you some examples. For example, estimated risk in a healthy young woman with BMI of 40 undergoing uncompleted, uncomplicated gastric bypass would be 
0.1%. Uh, Estimated risk in a 63-year-old uh, man with BMI of 60 undergoing a sleep with post-op length of stay of five days would be 1.5%. An estimated risk in a 48-year-old woman with BMI of 38 with pre-op dyspnea undergoing gastric bypass which needed reoperation and a prolonged length of stay for a surgical complication would be almost 5%. This table shows the performance of risk calculator in various cut points to detect post-discharge VT. On the first row, we see different cut points. When we're going down, we're going to include less patients when we increase the cut points. And we're going to decrease the sensitivity but increase the specificity. Based on the sensitivity and the specificity analysis, we believe that the cut point of 0.4% would be an appropriate cut point uh, for our patient population. It's going to include only 20% of our bariatric surgery population with sensitivity, sensitivity of 53% and a specificity of 80%. If we consider cut point of 1%, we're going to decrease the uh, sensitivity to 20%, but it's going to be, it's going to increase the specificity to 97%, so those are very high risk patients. And if you compare this cut point with the BMI, you're going to see that this cut point has better performance compared just to the BMI alone. Okay, so we identified the uh, high risk patients who needed VTE prophylaxis when they're going home. So the question here is, how would you extend thromboprophylaxis after bariatric surgery? So I'm asking about the choice of medication, the dose of the medication, and the duration of thromboprophylaxis after discharge. So Okay, let's go to some of our colleagues. Uh, why don't we go to Duke, uh, and Dana commented that they do extended prophylaxis uh, regimen. So with that in mind, um, could you be more specific Dana, on this dosing and the period of extension. Yeah, our policy up to this point, which uh, may require some updating, has been to send them out on Lovenox, 40 milligrams daily. Um, and we've done that, and it varies somewhat between faculty, between three weeks and a month. Um, and clearly, if someone came in on preoperative full anticoagulation, they'd go home on that. And, um, you know, we've kind of used our kind of gestalt whatever we as bariatric surgeons consider high-risk patients up to this point, and we feel that's been pretty okay, but I think uh, a more standardized approach is in order, and I think, uh, you know, as this talk's going on, I'm Googling that Apravita page and uh, trying to check that out, because I think this seems like an excellent uh, concept to use, and um, one that's tailored more to our field makes sense to me, so that we're not putting too many patients on it, but getting kind of that right balance uh, seems appropriate. So I commend the work that you're doing. Great. It's interesting, Dana. So you use 40 milligrams regardless of their BMI. So if their BMI is, they say, 65, 70, you still use 40 DID? That, that has been our approach. Um, and we've had, as Dan Heron mentioned, um, we've had different approaches over the time that's waffled back and forth based on bleeding complications du jour, and, um, and that probably isn't um, the right way to do it. Yeah. Now, um, Ali, this model that was created, and actually we use this model um, in our clinic, and in fact we require our fellows to uh, re report the, uh, the, the risk uh, prior to surgery on their pre-op visit, re report the uh, predicted DVT risk, and based on that, we apply this model. But does this model apply to non-bariatric? I mean, your database came from a pool of bariatric patients from the American College of Surgeons database. Could this be applied to Steve Wexner's colorectal patients? So we made it based, we included only bariatric patients on this model. We included only primary uh, bariatric procedures and revision bariatric procedures. But, uh, so the colorectal surgeons can, can you do the same similar type of study based on this uh, data set, huge data set, and make uh, their own model use the similar methodologies that can be a good research. Yeah. yeah. Now, Lee, I noticed from that list of risk factors, a couple things that were missing. Uh, history of prior DVT was not on that list. Why is that? Yeah, that's the main limitation of this model because these 
important risk factor are not captured in the NS American College of Surgeon and Group databases. So I'm going to address that later. In my okay. Talk. All right. Very good. Let's get some other opinions. Uh, let's go to Johns Hopkins. Mike Moran was talking about a little bit about their approach. Um, Mike, I see you there in the dark, just barely. <laughs> Um, so what about dosing and how long when you do this do you extend it and so forth? Do you want to comment? So just uh, our current protocol uses the Cabrini index and it's five you know five, five, for five, five and above. We prophylax for 30 days. And it's prophylaxis for 30 days for the colorectal patients. And nationally, we know, looking at this, that at less than 10% do this on an extended basis, but it's starting to become something that, just as the bariatric community is recognizing it's an issue, um, there are more people being aware this is a good topic. Very good. Yeah, so I think the extension of how long we carry this out is a big issue, Ali, that's not quite sorted out yet in the literature. Um, let's go to uh, Geisinger. Our folks at Geisinger um, had also a very... Um, um, proactive approach. Do you guys have a comment or question? Bill, no. can you hear me? Yes. Hey, Tony. Um, good. Y yeah, we do. We do 14 days for most patients, and I don't. I don't have the reference, but I think we use the chest guidelines, and, and ours is, is weight based. We send all our patients to a coag clinic preoperatively, uh, where they get their instructions based on their weight. Uh, but the, the chest guidelines that we used are, you know, a, a procedure greater than two hours, BMI greater than 30, and they say immobility, which they don't define real well. And we've kind of taken it to where we've said, well, we're just going to define our bariatric cases that way, even though we know there's variability. And this is, gets into the enhanced recovery protocols. Is We've kind of taken the idea that the more variables you're trying to to incorporate, the more difficult you're going to have, time you're going to have standardizing it. And so we've sort of erred on the side of we want to do the same thing for everybody. So if they have those three, which we're calling all bariatric patients, we do 10 days. If they have any more history of cancer, age, uh, their renal failure, a bunch of other things, then we go to 28 days. Okay. And so, Tony, what, what would you say in your bariatric population overall, what percent are actually going home with extended prophylaxis? A hundred percent, unless they have, uh, uh, yeah, pretty much a hundred percent. So okay. we call everybody three factors and we send everybody home on at least ten days. Okay. Well, that sort of makes it easy in terms of uh, management. There's no decision making. On the other hand, some of the other guys pointed out you know, I guess there's cost issues, but also the bleeding issue and, and maybe over prophylaxing, um, uh, which has, you know, has potential downsides. Um, but well, thank you two, for your comments two, on that. Go ahead. The two things that, so we've, we've looked at the bleeding. We haven't had any significant change in our rates of bleeding with patients. Um, the other issue, though, is, uh, and I don't know if this is unique, but our pharmacy is able to get grants Anybody who, who doesn't have coverage, they get grants to pay for it. So nobody's paying out of pocket for this. Okay, great. Thanks for your comments. Let's go back to Mount Sinai uh, with Dan Heron. And I think Dan has some comments, and I'd like to hear more about uh, specifically what you guys do. Dan? Dr. Pini had a question regarding the, the methodology of your study. Since uh, it looks as if we haven't validated the model with more data, would it have been a good idea to just split your data and create a model and use the rest of the data to validate it? <laughs> yes. He asked about validating your model. Yeah, so it needs external validation. You're right. So we split the data set to two group. We made a data. We made a model based on part of the data set and validated, internally validated with the other part. But you're right, it needs external validation by the other data sets. But you did do uh, a validation approach to it. You looked at, you compared the earlier years right. with the last two years. And the earlier year data predicted the last two years. Am I correct within yes. this database? Yeah. Yes, you're correct. But it needs external validation. Now, while we have you here, Dan, so what about um, specifically your protocol for extended prophylactic dosing, duration? Um, so we also use 40 milligrams of Lobanox for a 30-day approach. 
the problem being that for many of our patients, it's not covered by insurance, and unfortunately, we don't have the availability of such like a, a grant for, for our patients who can't afford it. So I would say of all the patients we prescribe it for, maybe two-thirds can actually get it, and about for one-third, it, it, it's just uh, economically unavailable. Isn't that odd that this is the number one cause of death after bariatric surgery, although death is rare, it's the number one cause, and when a patient has a PE, it increases their mortality 28-fold, and 80-plus percent of all PEs occur outside the hospital. Isn't it odd that we can't get uh, payers to pay for this? Uh, that's a, that's no, a rhetorical question. <laughs> Go so, ahead. So one, other question, one other question that I would have for you is it, that, that graph that you showed of the, the when the diagnosis was made is very, very interesting. But of course, we never know if we're making the the diagnosis on the day that the event has occurred. So we know that when you see one of those dots on the graph, that a DVT has occurred before that dot, uh, or that a PE has occurred before that dot. So the question is, do we really need to cover that full 30 days, or are, are those DVTs and PEs we're seeing on the right side of the graph um, really a representation of clots which have formed in the first couple weeks? If we could cut down the duration of DVT prophylaxis from 30 days, even though that's when we're making the diagnosis, to say two weeks, that becomes much more feasible and at, at both from an economic and from a logistical standpoint. So, so um, do we have a sense of how quickly we're picking up on the diagnosis, and can we shorten our anticoagulation postoperatively? That's a brilliant question. Ali, do you have a comment? So that's a that's a good start. Yeah, most likely there is some delay on the in diagnosis, but we didn't have that data, so basically that data was not available. But uh, yeah, there should be a delay. So I'm going to address that. Yeah. At the end. Okay. Very good. Um, and let's let's go to Ohio State because I know um, uh, Brad Needleman um, also has kind of an aggressive approach. Uh, can you tell us more specifically, Brad, your dosing and the duration and so forth? Yeah. I mean, our in-house dosing um, is BID. So if your BMI is under 50, we would do 30 milligrams of Lovenox twice a day. If it's over 50, we do 40 milligrams twice a day. Typically, if we send them home on Lovenox, it's usually for 40 milligrams once a day uh, for two weeks. And a lot of it is economics, too, because the patients that are paying for it out of pocket, we don't want to give them, make them a month supply if they don't need it. I think we reevaluate them in the office uh, symptomatically if they're ambulatory. The ones that walk into the office seem to be, you know, pretty ambulatory, doing what they're supposed to be doing, active, asking about walking. The ones that show up in the wheelchairs or still, you know, we may extend those for a full month. But typically, we would only plan on two weeks unless they had something else that we thought they needed longer for. Okay. Very good. That's very logical. Uh, let's go to um, Cleveland Clinic uh, Weston. I think uh, the group there had a question or comment. Hi, Phil. How are you? Regarding that Dan's comment, we, did, we actually did a study uh, in 2009, 2008, I believe, in which we did a uh, duplex ultrasound, 500, about 600 patients was the sample. Uh, these are bariatric patients, post of day one, routinely we conduct duplex studies. The incidence of DVTs in these patients was 0.2%, while we had a 2% bleeding uh, incidence within that same period. So at least we know within the first 24 hours that would be the number of DVT formations, uh, you know, on a rough uh, data that we got. Uh, there is a, a lot of debate about this, and it's the, the question is, if we're going to apply the, 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 the protocols, we need to do it as per described by, by the medications, by the companies. And in some of these patients, the dosage of sub-Q heparin, of uh, love notes that you're going to use becomes massive. We're talking 600-pound patients. If you multiply that by the weight, the dosages are, are really scary dosages, even though those are what the companies indicated. So, so it's a lot of debate. Taking the bleeding or the prophylaxis, it, it, you know, there is no. The, the society has been very smart in not putting any standards of care in this uh, regards. And we know, uh, you know, as Garnier, he doesn't even use any prophylaxis because he feels it's not even uh, uh, an issue. So, so we use here uh, just within perioperative period. Start with subcutaneous in the first 24 hours. 
in case of bleeding, as we saw a 2% incidence of bleeding, we can stop it rapidly. Within two, three hours, we're almost corrected. Then we establish love and at 40 BID routinely regarding of the way we do not adjust it, and we don't use extended use for anybody unless they have a previous history of P or anticoagulation. Okay, I'm very interesting. The, the whole issue about the data support and the dosing. Do you want to comment about that, Ali? That, that was interesting, the study. They couldn't find any <coughs> DVTs by screening in immediate post-op, and this data support that 83% of DVTs occur after patients are going home. So in hospital, screening shouldn't have any significant value yeah. in this patient. Yeah. I mean, this data is pretty clear. This is a database of 90,000 patients. Right. And 80% of all the DVTs are occurring at home within that one month period following surgery. What about the dosing? Um, he comments about the um, you know, lack of clarity in terms of uh, body weight based dosing in our bariatric patients. Yeah, there are some data. I'm going to review that quickly now. But uh, Do you have the slides for that? Yeah, I okay. do. Let's go to his slides again, please. Okay. So to, to address the question regarding the choice dosing and duration of prophylaxis, I'm going to use the literature to answer this question. So uh, first, uh, a study by the Michigan Bariatric Surgery Collaboration Group identified similar risk factors for the VTE, not post-discharge. Uh, overall VTEs similar to our findings, including age, BMI, male sex, longer procedures, non-gastric band procedures, and history of previous prior VTE. The other study by the Michigan uh, Bariatric Surgery Collaboration found that low molecular weight heparin was more effective than unfractionated heparin for prevention of post-op VTE, almost more, more than 50% more effective, with a similar rate of post-op bleeding. Several studies, many of them on the uh, pharmacology uh, journals, showed that in uh, severely obese patients, low molecular weight heparin provides better bioavailability compared to unfractionated heparin. It is less frequent injection and is associated with less heparin-induced thrombocytopenia and less osteoporosis. So it seems that uh, Lovenax would be a better choice for prophylaxis, especially in bariatric surgical patients. In terms of duration of the uh, extended prophylaxis, uh, if, we, if we take a look to surgical oncology experience, most centers administer four-week course of Lovenox as extended prophylaxis after major cancer operations. Uh, Specifically in the bariatric population, in hospital only versus extended VT prophylaxis, this study published in 2008 showed that in, that, uh, in, hosp uh, in hospital only versus 10-day prophylaxis using enoxaparin, the 30-day VT rate was significantly higher in the group that only received in hospital prophylaxis, 4.5% versus 0% in patients who were on extended prophylaxis. And seems extended prophylaxis, high dose uh, prophylactic dose is safe and is shown in multiple studies. Suggested prophylactic dose for Lovenox in bariatric patients is 40 milligrams sub-Q every 12 hours. But the point is that fixed doses of anticoagulant may be inadequate in severely obese patients. In this study, uh, published in SORD in 2008, after gastric bypass, 20% of patients in the 40 milligram q 2 lvh dosage, which was the standard dosing, did not reach the target VTE range assessed by the antifactor 10 level and needed dosage adjustment. That's significant number of patients, one-fifth of the patients. Uh, and if we take a look at the trauma literature, a recent study published this year in JAMA Surgery showed that after trauma, enoxaparin dosage adjustment by antifactor 10 could reduce the rate of VTE significantly from 8% to 1% without increasing risk of the bleeding. 
So it seems anti-factor uh, 10 11 can be utilized to monitor and adjust prophylactic dosing of low weight heparin for higher risk patients. And target anti-10 level for VT prophylaxis is uh, 0 0.2 to 0 uh, 0.4 unit per ml. In terms of the IVC filter, prophylactic placement of the IVC filter, filter many reviews, systematic reviews, and meta-analysis showed that uh, it's not a safe procedure to uh, utilize it uh, prophylactic uh, in bariatric patients. So based on this uh, uh, literature review and uh, our model, uh, we made this uh, strategy uh, and we categorized patient to three levels of risk, moderate risk, higher risk, and very high risk. And we uh, suggested some preventive strategies for each uh, risk level. So let's take a, a look deeply. So on the moderate risk, it includes all bariatric surgical patients without additional risk factors. So suggested prevention strategies in this group, which is going to be the uh, uh, majority of or majority of our patients, going to be early aggressive post-op mobilization, intermittent pneumatic compression, and in-hospital pharmacoprophylaxis. So since this group uh, doesn't uh, need extended prophylaxis. And for the in-hospital pharmacoprophylaxis, uh, here at the Cleveland Clinic, uh, we adjust the dosage of the Lovenax based on the body weight and the BMI. Prophylactic dose uh, for the patient with BMI under 50 is 40 milligram Q12, which in our practice, and over 50 is 60 milligram uh, Lovenax Q12, which. So high-risk patient population, it includes a calculated post-discharge VTE risk over 0.4% based on our calculator. And as you see here, the uh, last line, this cut point included only 20% of the bariatric population. So 80% of the patients won't need extended prophylaxis, so it seems. So, but, but as I said, we can decrease the cut point to increase the sensitivity, but it's going to include the uh, more patients. So, but since the, this cut point is a reasonable cut point, 0.4% based on the calculator. And as you mentioned, Phil, since this calculator, uh, we, we didn't have a, a data on the uh, some re important risk factors, including past history of DVT or PE, so we put them separately here. So uh, patient with past history of DVT or PE or patient who had congenital ac acute hypercoagulable conditions or significant chronic venous insufficiency are considered high risk. Other studies show that they are high risk for the DVTs and PE. So we put them here as a high risk group. So, so at least in other words, if the calculated risk is less than 0.4%, but they have a history of DVT or some type of hypercoagulable state or severe venous stasis disease, we automatically upgrade them to the very high risk category, right? Right, regardless of their risk okay. based on the calculator. And suggested prevention strategies would be in hospital uh, prophylaxis, uh, as B, uh, I mentioned before, plus extended post-discharge prophylaxis for two weeks. And it's going to be based on the body weight and the BMI. So we're going to extend prophylaxis for two weeks in this high-risk population. And we have another group, very high-risk population, a calculated post-discharge uh, VT risk based on the model over 1%. And if we choose 1% as a cut point, it's going to include only 2 or 3% of the study population. But these patients are very, very high-risk. So they needed ag more aggressive post-discharge prophylaxis. So uh, we suggested extended post-discharge prophylaxis for four weeks instead of two weeks. And in this high-risk group, we can consider those adjustments based on anti-10 le level. And we can consider DVT screening with duplex when they're going home 
uh, after we can consider a screening of the with the duplex. So to summarize, more than 80% of post-bariatric surgery VT events occur post-discharge. Prevalence of post-discharge VTE is above 0.3%. We could see 28-fold higher mortality rate with post-discharge VTE. We identified 10 major risk factors for post-discharge VTE, and all of which increased the risk of VTE by at least 1.5-fold. And uh, now we have a user-friendly online tool to estimate the risk. So we believe that the calculated VTE risk over 0.4% based on the calculator or and or presence of the hypercoagulable condition, past history of VT or significant venous stasis can be important indications for extended post-discharge prophylaxis after bariatric surgery. As we hear from our colleagues, they use the same concept, but now we have a model putting together all these factors that we hear from our colleagues. There is a small subset of patients, about two or 3% of the patient population which, uh, who are very high risk patients with a calculated risk over 1% which may benefit from even more aggressive preventive measures. And these patients may also be candidate for tighter screening compared to the general bariatric surgical cases. So the model and the, this table and the or suggestions are available in Arnold's paper. Uh, and I like to say that these suggested indications along with the type, those and duration of uh, pharmacoprophylaxis should be examined by high quality trials to see if we implement these uh, model in the practice, uh, how can we change the incidence of these serious complication. All right, very good, Ali. And, and as you said, I mean, this is a proposed model that needs further adoption, but as you can see from our audience, there um, is a lot of different approaches out there that people are kind of shooting in the dark to try to address this, uh, this issue. I think we surgeons, I include myself, um, sometimes are more interested in the post-operative death that is more surgical, like a leak problem, and we sort of consider a PE kind of an act of God, and we've done everything we can. But I think that's changing now. There's more that we can possibly do. So I think we as a community need to think about uh, this very, very carefully, our strategy on preventing PEs. It is an important cause of death after bariatric surgery. So let's go to uh, Florida. And I want to see if we've changed Steve Wexner's mind about this concept. Steve, what do you think? <laughs> Put you on the well, spot, buddy. <laughs> no, it's OK. It's an e excellent study and very thought-provoking. I, I think we need to look at the data for colorectal. And certainly, it's suggestive that in, in the high-risk group, and I, I like to think that we have a, a bariatric colorectal surgery practice here, given the size of many of our patients. They're coming in for reoperative pelvic surgery, redo pouches following leaks, reoperative surgery after recurrent rectal cancer, anastomotic leaks from rectal cancer, or the like, and they are at higher risk, and it, it definitely is worth looking. Having said that, my concern on some of these patients is the amount of dissection done in an often radiated pelvis, in a pelvis in which there's been chronic sepsis. It, there's not an insignificant risk of bleeding, which may well be different than in bariatric surgery, with the exception of the staple line itself for bleeding. So we have the staple line and added to it, we have the, the risk of a extensive dissection in a very inflamed pelvis. So I don't think it's exactly comparable. The risk may be comparable, but, but the, risk, the risk of DVT may be comparable, but the, but the risk of bleeding may not be. We need to look at that, but definitely worth uh, delving into it more deeply. Maybe a combination of this risk calculator, NISQIP, and our own data. So thanks, Ali, for a superb presentation. Congrats That's on the That's a good point. Very that, Those are great points, Steve. And I think we surgeons always wrestle with this. We don't want, we hate post-operative bleeding, right? The last thing we want to do is take someone back to the OR for bleeding or give a transfusion. We want to avoid that at all costs. So yes, it, it's so not just the bleeding, but, but we know from a lot of data, particularly like Neil Hyman um, in, when he was in Vermont, that a lot of leaks occur late. 
and leaks can occur from bleeding. You know, you've got some bleeding in the pelvis, you've got bacteria there already in these patients, they've had an anastomotic leak after a, a leaked anterior section, a leaked J-pouch, you add some blood, that's the patient you're going to get a leak that you're going to discover post-operative day 21 or 28, and a lot of them do occur late, so it's more than bringing them back for bleeding, it's having a delayed leak in a patient. Is it avoidable? I mean, again, we don't know, and we need to look at the incidence of that. Very well said. Very, very good point you raised, Steve. Ali, uh, last word. Uh, I think every surgical discipline can use these large data sets and make their own risk <coughs> model to decrease the risk of VTE, which can be preventable and which is a serious complication. Yeah. You know, this drives home very personally here. One of my colleagues uh, recently had a patient, a uh, bariatric patient, post-op day 29. 29, had a PE and died. And so there's nothing like that to really raise your concern about this problem. This patient did receive um, some um, you know, short-term extended prophylaxis. So this is a big problem that we just quite have not conquered yet uh, in surgery and definitely requires more attention.